Saga's return for their fourth main set appearance, and it seems that Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, not content with reinventing just an entire plane, is also pushing the boundaries of Saga design. So, what new features are in store for us, and are Sagas still the supreme way to tell stories? Welcome to Magic the Flavoring, the Magic the Gathering podcast, where we talk about all things magic, flavor, design, and lore. I'm your host, Andy Mann. Hello, this is Nathan Cancel. Episode 99. 99 La- episodes. Last of the double digits. Oh my gosh. I know. Didn't see that long ago that we were saying like, oh, you know, when we get to episode 100, kind of mockingly, and, and, that, and that, now we're here. And it doesn't feel like... It doesn't seem that long ago since we were at your work in Bunga Bunga being like, uh, oh yeah, like we'll definitely do this podcasting, we'll definitely do this podcasting. And then our mutual friend Luke Allen was like, oh, uh, yeah, what, is that going to happen? Is that a thing? We're like, yeah, 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 sure, 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 sure. Yeah. And then like a week later, like I actually bought the mic because uh, we were just using my Yeti when we were still recording in person, which we only got up to like 20 episodes or something recording in person or something stupid mm. before COVID hit. Um, yeah, it's been wild. It's been like two years. I know. A lot of stuff's happened. <laughs> a lot of stuff. Magic's a very different beast now than it, than it was two years ago. Like I feel the um, the momentum of... This is kind of interesting for, for, for this episode, right? I feel like the, the modern era, as it were. Is uh, is on is on our shoulders, and there's been a bit of prog- <laughs> progress to get. It. We've had to fight through some uh, some battles to get. It. But I feel like the modern sure. age is, is definitely in full swing. Um, so, mm. As I said, I literally had this bullshit arrive today. These lovely, these lovely, sexy monster, mon- monster hunt. What were they? What were they called? Monster movie I don't marathons. Know what you're talking together. about? Oh, did you not? And you're not looking at the camera. Like we have the camera set up for a reason, Andy. Yeah, what are they? Oh, right. So your secret lair. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. The secret lair, which are like the... Right. This is terrible podcasting, by the way. 99 episodes and we're absolutely... We're awful. So, hello. Hello, everyone listening, by <laughs> the way. Sorry. How's Nathan, it going? Nathan's just shown me over the camera that we're recording on. His secret lair has just shown up. And we're not talking about secret lairs today. And we'll, we'll pontificate no. more about our, our journey on podcasting when we reach episode 100 uh, in a mm. couple of weeks' time. Or uh, maybe slightly less, depending on our recording schedule say sorry well today we are going to be talking about the kamigawa sagas <laughs> sagas are back baby it continues it does it does they're here to stay clearly clearly they are a a story device that wizards are willing to continue with and also with throwback sets isn't it kind of like dumb not to use this as an opportunity of what stories from back in the day were told and what ones are being this is the perfect set for it right Oh sure. Well, I mean, but we say that every time they use them. We say that every time they use them. That's so, because they're great. They're, they're, that's they're because valuable. They're awesome. You can use them in so many different ways, even though you use them yeah. almost in the exact same way every time. So, well, sort of, sort of. So the reason, so right, the reason, the reason we're talking about this today in its own episode is because we did do our flavor picks episode last week, or how long ago the last episode was, um, and it would have just been way too easy to just stick sagas as all five of our flavor picks each of us do you know what i mean it could have been our honorable mention it could have been any of the top ones it could have been whatever we could have done the whole episode on it so i think we both elected to almost almost without saying i think we both were like yeah we're gonna do sagas as their own thing we can't put them in the flavor picks episode because that's just boring because (laughs) because they're all the flavor picks like and i think even last week we were saying the whole set is a flavor pick but Mm. yeah sagas have i mean sagas have appeared they've only appeared in four sets or five if we count as a saga no. <laughs> oh, so for them. Nice, good. <laughs> like, yes, that's all right. Urza Saga. Get, get out of here, Urza. No one cares about you. <laughs> Urza Saga, yes, was in Modern Horizons 2. So yes, Urza Saga does count as a as a fifth set, I suppose. But as a actual as an actual mechanic that was built yeah. around or used as a part of the set en masse. They've only been in four mainline sets, right? Yes, standard legal sets, um, which is crazy considering how much of an impact they've had on the game, and not just like, not just in the commander format, but just as as a piece of game design across all of Magic. Like it's wild, it's really wild. I mean, the fact also that they came in Dominaria was the first set where we used sagas, and then they didn't reappear until Caldheim, or uh, Theros Beyond Death. Sorry, but until Theros Beyond Death, like that's. That's a huge amount of time, and I know we've done uh, episodes on sagas before, and I know that we've spoken about them quite a bit, and because they are effectively the most flavorful of all card design. But mm. the reason we're we're running it back with the sagas Kamigawa is because they've 
They've amped it up again. They've done it again. Mm. They've pushed the boat. Dudes, the, these sagas flip. There's two, two-faced two sagas people and, in the yeah, world. Right. <laughs> what's going I mean, on? Guess, what's happened? I guess it's, what's interesting, right, is that this this is a very, very... Because that's 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 a uh, that's the point. Every single one of these sagas does the exact same format, right? Of where it has three chapters, and on the third chapter, um, they exile themselves and they return transformed. Um, yeah. And you could you could you could argue to a degree that that kind of um, it takes away some nuance of mechanical flavor because the third ability is just always the same ability. But you you'd be wrong because not you'd only. Be wrong. Not only does it also does the, does the, does it have its own flavor. And we'll talk about this in a, in a little bit. Does the um, the flipping have its own flavor? The, the, the thing on the other side having its own um, almost chapter. It's also then got the opportunity for flavor text. You're able to do something of like um, a before and after. So this is the story. For, this is the story that's being told, and then this is what how it manifests in the modern world. Like it's it's. I mean, obviously, it sounds stupid to say. I'll oh, put extra text on the other side of the card and it gives the, the card more uh, well obviously it's twice the card and this is why we've always quite liked this idea of um, cards that flip and tell a story as they do so but this is like mm. taking taking something that already has a bunch of story and then adding that quality to it it's, it's it's crazy yeah yeah it's crazy yeah for sure and also it's it's the perfect callback to og kamigawa as well which i don't think people really appreciate is the fact that in og kamigawa you had i mean we call these flip cards because we physically flip them over but they are modal double-faced cards is what what's he really wants us to call these things mm. or double-faced cards that's the thing they kept pushing over the past year of, of card design but the flip cards as we've discussed many times before are the og kamigawa cards which are it's one face but you spin them around on the table so like they have two like name boxes and, and all that kind of thing so the fact that they've brought the flip mechanic back and put it into Kamigawa so naturally just as part of modern card design is also just a really cool callback to the fact that flip cards were the thing in OG Kamigawa and this is like the mm. kind of more refined version of all of that kind of way of thinking and it's, they're just beautiful, they're absolutely beautiful um, I was looking at the the number of sagas per set that they've appeared in uh, off the top of your head Nathan what's the what, what do you think out of Dominaria Theros Beyond Death, Kaldheim, Neon, Neon Genesis, Kamigawa land but even um, evangelion <laughs> yeah well uh, i don't know what i don't know why i couldn't think of the name of the set um which one has the least amount of sagas do you think mm, uh, probably dominaria right nope you uh you you had it on the tip of your tongue there you almost said theros which you you're yeah right. i was, so that was, yeah, I was gonna go theros yeah <laughs> the, 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 the dominaria um theros born death had 10 sagas dominaria had 14 Okay. Kaldheim had 20. Yeah. How many does... That was the two cycles, right? Because it was the uncommon cycle and the rare cycle, and they were both multicolored. Uh, Kamigawa... Well, I know that there's a bunch of white ones, so I'm going to assume they've got an uptick by, what, probably about 25% again? So there's probably be about 25 of them. Oh, you've overshot. 23, I have it. Okay. Has. Okay. But still, it's still like... And then the, the, uh, Modern Horizons 2 had more, one. Right? Yeah, yeah, still more and more. What was, and that, that's only interesting to me because you'd have thought Kaldheim being the set of sagas and storytelling, like would have the most amount. Like it's it's quite incredible actually how many sagas are in Kamigawa. Like I just didn't twig it mm. until I pulled up the Scryfall page today to have a little look at it. But I guess the argument is right that just because Kaldheim is this plane of stories doesn't mean that Kamigawa doesn't have more stories to tell. Yeah, that's true. And you I guess know how like, ancient some of these planes are. Yeah, I guess cause the thing is, I guess they kind of needed to define each individual realm's history, right? And they kind of could do that with, across two, and that's how that's, that's how it works. With some some of them are a little bit more nebulous, um, but um, I think for most of them it was kind of like a this is the way we explain and give some history to each of the uh, realms without having you know the opportunity to otherwise go too far into you know you've got ten realms. Here's a little drive by blurb about them, and they just chucked down a saga, and it kind of worked for that, mm. right? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, this, the flavor is just is just incredible. I just to bring it back. I mean, as as people can probably tell, this is a relatively loose episode, only because there's just there's so much going on. the The fact that they've just decided to split the story of all these sagas across not just the ancient history of Kamigawa, but also like its more modern facets as well is just pretty amazing. the The fact that the thing that it flips into is always an enchantment creature as well. Mm-hmm. We're not just flipping into like another like sort of saga esque mode, or like say even even just one or other. Like it doesn't just flip into a creature or an enchantment. 
the fact that they are all enchantment creatures is a significant design choice because it really tells the story of Kamigawa and how Kamigawa approaches its own history as well. Like, there's lots of motif throughout all of the Kamigawa sets, like old and new, about things like living lore and living history. Like, you see that um, kind of motif in a lot of the names of the legendary creatures or in a lot of the artwork, you know, where the characters like Reiki or Reki, sorry, tattoo themselves, or if they have, like, their maybe their dress is invoked with, like, the law, the written law of Kamigawa. And so to have enchant- to have representations of the law act also as physical entities unto themselves is a very Kami-esque, very Kamigawa approach to, to their history. And I think it's an absolutely perfect design. You couldn't have done that, for example, with uh, Kaldheim. Like as as much as like you mm. maybe could have had like some sort of like mythical creature or like Theros for example, there's obviously enchantment creatures in Theros because they're all Nyx born, but I think you would have struggled to have to have found the flavor of having a, an enchantment creature on the back of all of the sagas from from Theros for example. Yeah, I think that's a, a very good distinction. That it's funny that in a set where there were a bunch of enchantment creatures, because I feel like that's a, a again a difficult like thing to define like what makes enchantment creature an enchantment because obviously there are a bunch of creatures that have like static effects right like um, i guess mm. the thing a good example of these were like the archetypes from theoros of where they weren't just it wasn't just a bore right it was it wasn't just like a, a bestowed upon kind of thing of where not only am i am i an elk but i could also be like you know a, a totem elk kind of shield around you kind of thing like fair enough that makes sense of how bestow works um whereas you had other ones like say the archetype of endurance of where it gives all of your stuff an effect and takes an effect away from your opponent, almost has like a, a residual effect beyond its creatureness. Whereas it feels mm. like it's slightly different in Kamigawa. Like it's not that these are like, have like a slight different essence to them. It's, it's, it's really hard to define. I'd like to see kind of um, a conversation of kind of how they handle like from a law perspective what 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 makes a creature an enchantment where is the line between being an enchantment and an, and just a, an enchantment creature and where's the line between a creature and a creature enchantment because you can argue a lot of the legends from original kamigawa had these kind of weird abilities right which would feel like enchantment effects if they weren't also printed with power and toughness which is kind of a guess what they're going for here but i think the other thing that um with, with these sagas specifically um is that the creature itself is spawned from the law. The only way that this creature exists mm. is from the law that came before it. And that law is the effect of that enchantment that the story and the, and the weight it carries and the magic that it carries with it, right? Like words have meaning and have power and strength within within the world of magic, as we can see. We've gone to four to slash five different, different planes and seen how the stories have gravitas and have effects and have their own magic. Um, so it's yeah, quite nice sure. to see in Kamigawa then manifest into living things that you can then, you know interact with or can they're very different various different swings on it throughout these different sagas as well it's not all just the same thing of where oh story manifests sometimes it's the oh no but like you know maybe there's uh the shade of 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 this of this legendary still around or maybe it's the uh the anger of of a legendary creature manifested and, and it has its own life and its own whim or maybe it's even something simple as a kami that's passed over you know from the spirit from the spirit realm because of what's happened so there's like there's a, some very good examples of this, like of, of, say of the kind of spread. So if you have a, if we let's look at some specific uh, sagas now. So you have something like the Modern Age, which is a blue saga, uh, common saga. Uh, its first two modes are draw a card and then discard a card. Its third mode is exile and then it comes back. And on the uh, back side, it comes in as Vector Glider, which is a spirit and charming creature with flying two three. And the flavor text literally is: it drifted from the spirit realm into a neon world full of new possibilities and decided to stay. So as we know from like uh, from the Kami from Kamigawa, much like I guess the the gods of Nyx in Theros, a lot of their roles on the plane are dictated by maybe the manifestations of everyday life, or perhaps it's everyday life that's informed by their manifestation. Like it's it's a very sort of symbiotic relationship. So the fact that you have this vector glider spirit who is effectively like a Kami but like a neon kami because of the modern world it's come into the physical and gone oh yeah this is this is where i'm meant to be this kind of idea that perhaps if it came into kamigawa 1200 years ago it would have pissed off back to the spirit realm do you know what i mean like it's this really nice idea so that's a very literal idea of like it turns into the modern form of a kami but then you have something like uh life of Toshiro umazawa which of course tells the life of Toshiro umazawa um beautiful art as well we'll talk about a bit about the art but this sumi uh ink painting is like fucking great um 
And then the life of uh, Toshiro Mizawa comes back in as memory of Toshiro. Still a 2-3 human samurai, but the actual idea of it is it's not it's it's the memory of this character that's being invoked. And the flavor text is, uh, some called him a hero of the Kami War, others a selfish thief. As ever, the truth is hidden somewhere in between. No mention of this thing being actually a physical manifestation of memory of Toshiro, but because of the lore that we understand it, we can, as mages, I guess, or playing the game of Magic the Gathering, manifest the memory of Toshiro into existence. Mm. I mean, it's just just so playful. Like, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. What are, what are the sagas that kind of uh, break out to you that if you had to have a look through? What's the ones that, for whatever reason, like artwork, mechanics, story? So I really liked, um, and this is this is another thing we, uh, we haven't said, that all of the, not all of them, but 10 of the sagas that are listed here also got their own little like um, story article blurby kind of things. Yes, as well they as, did, yeah. As, as much as these are kind of like a, a history of the plane to, like even in the metaverse, telling the story to the generations after um, within the plane of Kamigawa, they're also mm. reminders to the players of the stories and the, and, and, and the legends from the original Kamigawa block. And for, for yeah. those that weren't around, we got some little story blurbs things like the ca- little little drive-by of the kami war and what happened and how it was um, how it was all caused uh, it was a good way for the for the uh, modern audience to get caught up and then also on the cards kind of have have the modern audience get caught up whilst the plane's also catching itself up um, i liked the shattered states era i liked this idea of i didn't really know this aspect this story and i love the idea that the art um, that the story is being told on the, on the hilt of a uh, katana because it's something mm. we talked about a lot during cow time of where we don't just want to see the story like, it, like even on just on a tapestry isn't t- ne- isn't necessarily the most exciting like and this and this kind of is epitomized um, in the Kamigawa where it shows various different forms of how we tell stories right there's mm. urns in some of them there's there's as i say reliefs on um on um sword hilts um there's quite clearly like paintings as well as like artwork on a fat like there's loads of different forms that it's coming um and i don't think any of them are the real texture like we got in cow time like the carving for example um that everyone obviously lost their lost their minds about uh by victor adame Minguez. um i don't we had any of that in this but it looks like they very no, much but they are pushed. yeah I, th- I think it's interesting because uh, it, it's a weird one obviously all cultures have things like actual sculptures and like you know a, a, every kind of ancient culture has like say like a tattoo heritage or like a, a weaving heritage or whatever else but what i tend to find from a lot of japanese um uh artistry is that it's a lot of prints and imagery put onto physical objects so i, su- I suppose that you could have had an artist say create an actual ukiyo-e like uh print block and actually you know use that layering technique but that's like incredibly extensive and also incredibly um like it, you need to be an expert at that kind of wood print you can't just knock that out but even something like the the fan art uh like japanese folding fans folding fans were invented in japan and you know are a big part of japanese culture not just as part of art but also like samurai were said to use them as like weaponry in warfare so you know they're a huge part of the aesthetic of what people understand as japan and obviously on uh what's the uh where's the saga which has the uh fan print on it oh yeah, yeah uh, Mich- michiko's Mich- reign of reign. truth yeah. yeah we do get the we get the image of a depiction of a folding fan with the michiko condor art on the fan itself which is something that you would do but i think it would be a lot to ask for example an artist uh especially like like you know mainstay artists like titus Lunter or vulcan Barger for michiko's reign of truth to get a folding fan and then do the art on the folding fan like mm-hmm. i think that's maybe a step too far like it was nice that we got a carving because that's something that victor jamie Mingus wanted to do but I don't know if you could do that for every set. I <laughs> think that's, that's yeah, we were spoiled by Kaldheim. Do you know what that's I mean? That's the thing, right? Yeah, you get you get given something that's like above and beyond, and then everyone's like, "But why can't we always have that?" Mm-hmm, <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. It's like, so why did you why did you give us something, and then and then only to give us a little taste? Um, I guess it's also interesting as the symbols changed, right? As well, uh, the symbol in the top left hand ki- uh, corner. Oh, is, sure. it a, is it a closed fan into open fan? Is that what it's supposed to be representing? Uh. Because yes. I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've seen it mentioned anywhere else. Um, it looks no, like no. I do you know what I don't though. know if I've. Well, that's it's only changed because I suppose the arrows aren't necessarily uh, because you're not. Oh, I don't know. Is it because maybe it's trying to tell you? Whereas things like the lands, you know, the lands that could come in at one side or the other. Mm. I suppose they both look the same on either side. Whereas these are very like the framing is different. 
Do you know what I mean? Well, I guess it's the Maybe. first time we've had a because uh, because it, it's only these these symbols only get put on the MDFCs, right? To kind of show you that this is the side it's supposed to be on, and this is the side that happens after a while, right? But it's just it's kind of I just like the fact they went for a fan fan motif um, out of out of well, everything. Well, I suppose Illustrad has always understated done that. almost. Yeah, well, cause, and then yeah. I guess they swapped right for Eldritch Moon of where they had um, the Emrakuli kind of symbol, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah that's, that's what I mean. Like nice. Innistrad for their MDFCs have always had the the different symbols. I think it's just we've gotten used to recent sets having the arrows, the up arrow mm. and the up down arrow, whatever it is. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's kind interesting. Of, yeah, exactly. So, look, yeah, exactly. It's just a, just a little just a little tiny thing, right? But that's what I quite like. And the the only thing. So my only main criticism against, um, and I kind of mentioned this earlier when, when I was talking about how mechanically, flavor-wise, having all of them do this, the thing uh, on their third chapter of Exile and, and re- Return, it's kind of, it, that's not there. It might as well just be that the other side of the card is there. Um, mm. The other thing that kind of I feel like is that they, they these are the abilities on the cards aren't quite as nuanced. Um, I feel like that, that that they kind of push the nuance on, on cow time to, to the point of where it was kind of a chore to read them. You know, like it was kind of almost a bore to read them. Like it felt like the the the, the cards did something very much more specific and um, um, an individual. Whereas I feel like the, the the effects on the Kamigawa ones are slightly more generic, which isn't a bad thing whatsoever. Because I feel like a lot of the flavor comes from the eventual story on the backside. Not necessarily like the stages you have to get through to get to the to the front side or to get through the front side. Like Life of T- Toshiro Mizawa, for example, has um, uh, the first two chapters a choice of one of the three effects that you had on a uh, on his Gita, right? Of either to mm. give a creature plus two plus two, give a creature minus one minus one, or gain two life. And then on the flip side, he he uh, flips, um, it flips into a two three that you can tap and pay one life, add a black, but only use that to to cast an instant or sorcery. Harkens back to his legendary card where you can cast one. Um, instant or sorcery from your graveyard um, per turn. I think I think it's a black yeah black instant or sorcery from your. Anyway, he has an interaction with um, instant um, instant sorceries in your graveyard, and obviously this can fuel that. So if you have a Toshiro deck, this is like flavor home run because the memory of Toshiro can help Toshiro from the past. So that 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 works. I do I do find that there is a slight diminish on the effects on the front face. That kind of then gets the added benefit on the reverse, where right? I feel like the flavor's kind of back ended rather than front faced, if you know what I mean. So I think I think that's a definitely a gameplay design. That's a really interesting thing sure, that you yeah. said. So I, I've got I've got the page up uh, with all of the sagas that have ever been printed. I'm just having a look through the Kaldheim ones now, and obviously Kaldheim had the ten realms. It had the ten tribes because it was also a tribal set that I think sometimes gets a little bit overlooked because each tribe was dedicated to a color pair, and obviously each color pair got then two sagas dedicated to it. So they were very targeted either to the tribe itself or maybe like the play style that, you know, is going on. Um, actually, I think, I, I think I've slightly misremembered that. There are, there's more combinations of like uh, sagas to the tribes, but whatever. So for example, like the, the Blood Sky Massacre is created two, three red demon berserker creature token with menace. So that's like demon specific. You've got Bears of Lit Yara has like shapeshifter things, uh, shapeshifter synergies. Forging the Tyrite Sword is all treasures and equipment based, which, you know, for the for the red white dwarves was their whole kind of thing. So I think they did fit much more into the archetypes of play for specific paths in either draft or limited or for commander, for example, if you want to build like your your Narfi deck, you're gonna want the Narfi like, you know, uh saga whereas i think you're right for the for the sagas for kamigawa i think they're just because they're such a big part they're 23 cards in a set Mm. if you make them too specific to a set that isn't necessarily drawn so hard anymore on say tribes because they didn't really they're not really doing hard tribal in this set like there's like samurai synergy and like ninja synergy and ninjutsu but you're not necessarily defined to go down those lines no I think they do have to make them more broad, but I think the flavor is is there in every all the rest of the presentation, like you say, like a Kiba Reckoner raid, for example, which is my for my money actually my favorite saga. I keep going on about the Nazumi in this set. I fucking love them. They I do look great. so cool. Yeah, that style is so. This is such a good idea. It's such a good transition into a whole other genre of like what Kamigawa is, and they're still fulfilling the role that they're doing, but whilst being completely different. It's brilliant. Anyway, so a Kiba Reckoner raid. The first two modes of it are each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. That's not a a rat synergy or an injured synergy or even really a, a reckoner synergy. That's just what black does, right? Mm. Um, which is fairly broad. But then on the backside with Nozumi Road Captain, uh, it has itself is a rat rogue with two two with menace, and then vehicles you control have menace. So it kind of fulfills everything that you want to do. Like you, and because it only costs one mana, 
you could stick it down if you're just doing kind of generic black stuff and be like, yep, for two turns I get to have this effect and then I get a creature out of it. But then also mm. if you're going heavily into the, like the Nozumi or black vehicle strategy, the flip side also has that super flavorful thing as well. And I just think, yet again, yet again, they've they've got these sagas and they, they have room to play with form and function that works on almost every level that you want it to work on as a, as a magic player. Also, as a side note for Nozumi Road Captain, we were talking earlier about how the representations of what the enchantment creature actually is can be quite broad. This to me is just absolutely hilarious. The fact that this isn't like some kind of ancient carving or like the sort of manifestation of a memory of like some ancient hero. This is literally some dude's graffiti jacket <laughs> and the graffiti mural on the back of the jacket is the enchantment creature because it's mm. evoking exactly what the Nozomi are all about to the point where it's like it's like their banner it's their symbol it is who they are and so it's that manifestation you know united by the de- by defiant pride in their outsider status the Nozomi uh, of the Akiba Reckoners boast the most advanced cyber bikes and the best riders of all the Reckoner gangs like Come on, man. Again, Victor Adame Mingus is absolutely on fire in the past few sets, man. But yeah. Yeah, I, I like to th- I like to brilliant. think that the guy in that artwork on the front, like it's almost the opposite. The coat's telling the story, but he is the, the road captain on top and he's only... The oh, interesting. Oh, that's a you cool You know what I mean? Idea. It's almost like the reverse yeah, yeah. of it. I mean, I guess like there's also from a um, design point of view, they very much, they, they the way they balanced out having both equipment like heavy equipment theme and then also a heavy enchantment theme because that was kind of the way they did they had an artifact uh so i guess so i should say so a heavy artifact theme and a heavy enchantment theme is that they made half of the artifacts vehicles so they could go they're, they're not artifacts and they can become creatures and then all of the mm. equipment can reconfigure into creatures and then all of these enchantment sagas because you need your enchantment synergies they also then flip into creatures as well and it kind of as much as it kind of then makes every, everything feel like oh well i guess everything's just a creature they're like well yeah but kind of almost in their own ways and the fact that you have them all side by side almost creates more of a diversity of flavor than a everything's also a creature kind of thing like it's it's funny how they do it in different ways and that can kind of still give them all mechanical like, like individual identity um and again I, I don't i'd love this idea of where the story the story is being told for years and years and years and it's it's got such gravitas that it then as you say as we've said manifests into into this different creature and it's not always the exact same way sometimes it's almost like bringing it back like so my, one of my mm. favorite ones is behold the unspeakable mostly because when i was when i was younger um was it, what, let me let me find the, the, tr- the trio of cards i think it was peer through depths reach through mists and sift through sands oh he remembered them off the top of his head look at that um, and th- <laughs> basically there were three arcane spells if you happen to play all three of them in the, within the same turn um you would be able to get um search your library for a card the unspeakable and it's like a six five flying trample or something and you know mm. it's it, cool effect i love the idea that you could use these different pieces to kind of they go and cheat it out and it was almost like the um the Saratami were like like almost like kind of delving into Eldritch. It was almost like the Eldritch horror kind of thing before Illustrad kind of coined that and kind of took it for its own. Um, and I like the idea that, that on the flip side of of of, of the of Behold the Unspeakable, it's the vision of the Unspeakable, which is a, a flying trample um, zero zero gets plus one plus one for each card in your hand. Obviously, the front side does things that you know increase your hand size. And the whole point was with even if you play all of this in an Unspeakable deck, all of the here through depths here through sands they're all like card selection and card draw effects as well so it all kind of plays to itself and it's not that the, the, the unspeakable is back no it's that you have a vision of the unspeakable it's almost like you have to go on like almost like a vision quest kind of thing and i just love this idea because this was one of the biggest like uh was it almost, almost like like a little like quest when i when i first i was opening cards because i never opened the unspeakable i only opened um th- the three um kind of fetch cards and it's only on one of them that it mentions you can go and get it so it was almost like its own legend within the set for me so it's really nice to then see that come back and i imagine there's a, it's the same for a few people like that like again the tashira one's a very obvious one um the fable of the mirror breaker is obviously a massive um harken back to kiki jiki um mm. and i like that when you travel twelve thousand years in history you might feel like you're going to lose a lot of the things that that you liked in a set and a lot of the old old players might be like oh we're, we're not going to see too much of the old school because it's kind of unlike dominaria where every other legend's immortal like a lot of the people that we've seen and have, have loved and ever, all of that nonsense are dead you know okay hit it sugu's still around but he's you know a, a demon fueled ogre you know not everyone's got long that kind of longevity <laughs> so it's quite nice that there are a few throwbacks um to to to, to stories and to characters that will be like you know fan favorites um, and I think yeah, it's the perfect sure. kind of way to do it, you know. And again, you're not like re—it's not like you're rehashing. It's almost like you're reinstating 
the law of Kiki Jiki, right? It's not like, oh, it's just another version of Kiki Jiki. It's like, no, it's that the Kiki Jiki's influence still is on Kamigawa, you know? That's what makes it good. It's not the fact that they went, oh, what legends can we just slap into a weird, you know, Frankenstein's enchantment creature and go mm. like, hey, here's your nostalgia kick. It's like, well, no, it's kind of, it's an homage, right? Rather than they, um, like, than a cheap how, how else? How else are they meant to do it? How else are they meant to do it? See, this is right. this is why this is why this set sings. And <clears throat> I actually think I think on the ground this set is actually more divisive than I think we give it gave it credit for. I was at uh, our local game shop the other day, um, and uh, I was listening into people's conversations. You know, as you kind of do, like when you're sat in a cafe or whatever. I was this, I was there. Till, I was on, I was on Friday. It was Friday the eighteenth. So obviously that was when the the paper magic is is released to the world because I tend not to. Um, get like I, I didn't go to pre-release this time around so i didn't get any like early products so i was getting my, my bundle as i want to do and i was kind of sit there flicking through my cards and there was a couple of conversations drifting through the air about people being like oh i really like this we really like that but then there are other conversations being like you know this set really isn't for me like this is the step too far in terms of its cyberpunkiness and this is essentially just them like lubing us up for when they <laughs> bring in warhammer <laughs> like do you know what i mean um like Fortnite and, you know, I liked, like that yeah. yeah yeah exactly and you know i liked camo i liked um kaladesh and mirrodin but for some reason this is just the other side of that coin right and that's totally fine so i don't think the set is maybe as universally loved as we in our sphere of being on like on social media a lot and, and engaging with a lot of people who say like make the game or like other content creators for, for some reason there just seems to be this kind of like little dissonance there but what what i'm trying to get at is is that the people who kind of naysay about this not being just old kamigawa but a return to is that this is how you have to do it we you do have your old characters you do have your homages and there's room to do that but without just filling up the set with the same old legends again and again and again as much as, you know, I really appreciate the fact that, say, Odrix and your, like, uh, your Niv-Mizzets all get, like, three cards each, eventually that's going to get real tired. Like, how many versions of the same Legendary can you have again and again and again, especially if you return to your fan-favorite planes? And, you know, there's a whole block of Kamigawa out there for people to enjoy if they want to. We're going to do something new with it. We still want to give you your old Legends. This is how you do it. And I think, mm. why not? It's yeah, it's absolutely perfect. I don't, I don't see what the what the big deal is really. Um, yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, yeah. Another uh, stand up for me is um, the fall of uh, Lord Condor, Condor, because oh, sure. it, this is kind of, I think this one kind of shows more than more than anything. Kind of almost like the beginning of the story, which is kind of uh, it's not even necessarily at the beginning of the story, but I like the the succinctness of uh, you exile the creature with mana value four greater. Obviously, that's um, Condor getting defeated. Each player gains mm. control of all permanents they own. That's that which was taken being returned, you know, uh, Kyodai kind of being freed from her prison, um, stolen by Konda. And then as you flip it, it flips into the fragment of Konda. Um, and this is lovely. It, it says it in the flavor text here, but the, the, uh, the story goes that after Konda was defeated, he was, you know, um, for his transgressions against the Kami, his immortal body was turned to stone and then shattered into a thousand still living pieces. And what I love is that mm. this little picture of him on the reverse side, if you look on the main on the main picture it's another, again a lovely stone relief i think these stone reliefs we've seen all the way um, back since um um the original triumph of gerard you know like that same kind of motif yeah, yeah, having yeah. and chain is torment i think was the same kind of thing of where it's like a a stone facer right and i think this is kind of one of the ones that kind of sings to me more is that the this idea of this is how like kind of history in england in, in, not in just england and in, um in, in on earth um kind of presents right of where you do all of these like uh, car- like stone carvings right so it kind of plays to me more and right at the bottom you have him all kind of shrinking and 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 and, and kind of cowering in fear and on the flip side it's just got a giant crack through his through him himself and he's a one three defender when he dies draw a card i don't really care about that but i love the fact that even the enchantment creatures are human noble you know i love mm-hmm. this idea that there are still fragments of conda out there still alive still in pain like I know it's a bit macabre, but I mean, you know, he fucked up the entire plane, so he kind of deserves it. <laughs> I just love that. I love that yeah, they can yeah, lean yeah. into that. And if you know the story, it's it's it, it it sings even more. And if not, and if you don't know the story, now you do know the story. You know, so it doesn't take a lot. I mean, Conda's kind of one of those interesting characters because he was one of Magic's first white aligned villains. So it's kind of a yes. like he's a he's a real shit. <laughs> he's a real shit bag. Mm-hmm. Complete imperialist. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, and one one of my favorite. Uh, cards from the set. I was obviously the uh Akiba Reckon Raid is like is for me peak like neon uh dynasty like for the new stuff. But in terms of what's blending old and new, 
And it's also, I think, one of the cheekiest cards in the set for a, for a kind of reason that I don't think any, this is necessarily a big deal, but it's just an interesting one to me. Uh, and that's uh, Besiju Reaches Skyward, or Besiju Reaches Skyward, uh, art by uh, uh, Sezu Chen. The reason I love this card so much is not only is the flavor like pretty decent on the front side, like we were talking about how maybe it's a little bit, eh, like, you know, the flavor's maybe just a little bit broader, but actually I think this really works for Besiju, where mm. the first... Uh, mode is search your library for up to two basic forest cards reveal them put them into your hand and then shuffle so that's obviously the the idea that you know the the natural forces of kamigawa are very strong and like a gathering all around then uh the second mode is put up to one target land card from your graveyard on top of your library again if you're moving into more modern kamigawa it's the idea that the you as a tree is trying to reclaim a lot of the territory of like the modern world encroaching on it so it's you know it's re regrowing from the ashes of like industry destroying some of like the more natural order and then it's also on the being back put side... on top of your library right so it's actually the tallest out of everything you yes can exactly yeah, yeah yeah which is beautiful and then on the back side it's branch of besage you enchantment creature plant zero zero and then with reach which is just excellent for the flavor of besage you being the tallest thing on kamigawa again and then the branch of besage you gets uh plus one plus one for each land you control so the more natural uh, order you have the stronger it is so it's just really sort of flavor all the way through um the the flavor text is uh though they raised the surrounding forests the builders of tawashi left besage you unscathed shaping the city around the ancient tree i just think as a as a saga it's just incredibly solid. The other reason I, I think that this is one of the most solid sagas uh, is the artwork itself. So again, by uh, by uh, Zezu Chen, it's uh, woodblocks. So it's Japanese woodblocks, which are um, Yosegi's uh, Zakuri. I'm terrible with Japanese pronunciation, but that's that's the, the joined uh, construction technique. But not only is it trying to represent this art style, which is like, incredibly popular in Japan, but it's it's done in such a way that it's also sort of like... 8 bit and uh or 16 bit i suppose so it's, it looks like a, a tech glitch like how you would sort mm. of you know usually associate with things like cyberpunk you see it all throughout the artist direction of this set for example so it's a really nice blending of traditional art styles used to mimic or ape more modern aesthetics which is obviously what the whole deal with this set is about which is just absolutely fucking amazing the reason i think it's a bit cheeky you can agree with me or disagree with me we have a Perseidu card in this set Besaju is literally a card in this set. So the fact that they've given it its own saga is like they've gone, we love this tree so fucking much, we're going to give it two cards. <laughs> Do you not think? No, yeah. Azusa doesn't get a card in this set, they get a saga. Well, I guess the idea, right, is one, Besaju is still here. What? So it's, it's not only, it's, it's almost like this, not only do we get to see Besaju as it is, but we get to know the story of it, of how it got there. Because some people come and look at this tree and be like, cool, big tree. And they'll be like, well, big tree, and why are the roots like that? You know, like why are they? What? What? What's? Ha- what? How did it? Why did it decide to? <laughs> what's going on? You know, and then you go, oh yeah, th- th- this is why. And you know, th- the idea being that because I, I, when I first read the story, I didn't and I didn't see any visual for Besaju. I just assumed that it just carried on trying to grow like a normal tree, not going. I'm a, I'm the tree, and then all my roots are just going to like extend like a fucking like a Gary's mod glitch, you know? And it's just going to yeah. extend up and just go like I, I'm the, still the tree at the top, you know? I don't, it's not a trunk anymore. It's no, the roots just decided to push me up. So I guess you know, mm. it, it's almost like you need the you, you don't just need the the living legend as it were. You need the the story behind it as well. And I guess besides you can't really tell its story because it's a tree and not a tree folk. God, imagine if you animated besides you Nissa never come to Kamigawa please <laughs> like, who would win make... uh who would win in a fight between vitu gazi and besaju a besaju fight 100 percent. vitu gazi could barely take on a single it's got eternal besaju would raise <laughs> Kawasha. it would raise the entire get capital wrecked. Yeah. get wrecked ravnica you and your shit trees yeah your no one cares about spirits. you you think you've got a good city <laughs> bitch come back when you got some neon going on come on Get it together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Way to show. All right. No, yeah, I agree. Radical. I agree. But you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Well, we still get a few different mediums as well, right? Like, because we got the, we, as you said, you had the fan. We've got the um, the handle on the katana. Azusa's many journeys, as you mentioned, it's, it's her robe because she even painted the different places she went onto on her robe. Um, I like the idea of that as well. I mean, I, again. Yeah. It's a kimono. Yeah. Yeah, the kimono. Exactly. Where, what the, so this is my question to you, Andy. Mm. Kind of, where else now? Because. We're very, there's no other sets we're going to see a 12,000 years later kind of thing of. And Cow Time mm-hmm. was almost like built as a, 
as a plane of of fables and stories. I don't know how late into their development and process that was that was kind of put in, you know, as opposed mm. to like the ten realms or whatever. But it kind of f- front faces whole storytelling, you know, Bose and Arnie and all of these people that were very much around telling the story and having the best story you could have, you know, taking that to your grave. Where what where's the next place we could see sagas? And I don't don't just do, to take the easy route and go. Well, we're going back to Dominaria later in the year. Oh that, that, yeah, that was exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, um, I just answered my own question as I was asking. I was like, fuck, we'll go back to we're going no, back we're gonna to see them. In, we're going to see them in Dominaria. Um, yeah. Well, it's an interesting one, right? So I'm gonna I'm, let's let's I'm gonna show my working on this one. So mm. if we look at the, all the sets that have had sagas in the past, past four sets, not including Modern Horizons two, get fucked. Um, because we've got to assume that's of Dominaria them, as well as a saga, right? Well, like, yeah, yeah of course it is. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for, yeah. Sure, for sure. Three out of the four have had quite uh, real-world aping motifs, right? So, obviously, you know, Theros Beyond Death is ancient Greece. Uh, Kaldheim is Norse mythology and, you know, uh, that whole part, kind of part of the world and tradition. And then uh, Neon uh, Dynasty is obviously uh, Edo-era Japan or like ancient, you know, Japan. So they can pull from the techniques and traditions of real world societies to make the sagas more interesting. And I think we've become accustomed to that and the idea that, you know, oh, well, we want to see like a saga told on the side of a clay pot. Oh, we want to see, you know, some Japanese lacquer work or like, you know, on a fan. That's really cool. That's a really cool way to do it. But if we remember all the way back in Dominaria, when we first saw the sagas, they were able to tell these stories in... A, a kind of situation where it's a fabricated history and culture. So although something like History of Banalia, uh, by the artist who we won't bother talking about, um, yeah. kind of used uh, uh, stained glass windows, and you had something like, you know, the Morari conjecture was uh, like a star map and all these kinds of things, you also had Phyrexian scriptures, which was the artwork and the style of storytelling was a Phyrexian blood altar. Which, mm. although, all right, you have to like pull something from somewhere. Like, you can't just make up something from nothing. Like, in terms of our own real world, it's a it's a fictionalized history, right? Mm. So you could, if they wanted to go, go down that route, oh. do any plane spinning tails, They'd, right? So yeah, it's just spinning tails. So, for example, we're going back. We're going to New Capenna. Back to New Capenna. What a stupid <laughs> no, going... no come, let's get, let's come back to that in twenty twenty six, shall we? <laughs> yeah, right. So we're going to New Capenna next, right? Which is nineteen twenties uh, U.S. Art Deco, right? So we're talking mm-hmm. East Coast, like Chicago and and New York. And although that's about <laughs> as modern. It's, it's about imagine, as modern as we're going to get. I'm just imagining demons with a Bronx accent, and it's just it just made me chuckle. <laughs> oh, just of course, of like... course. Imagine the voice lines on. It's going to be um, so funny on Magic Arena for like yeah. some like for you know Obnixless. <laughs> yeah, he comes out, <laughs> stuck him up, you fools. <laughs> yeah, you want to sleep with the fishes? Uh, to sleep I'm with so the merfolk. Sorry. <laughs> oh God, we need to stop. Um, oh, so sorry, brilliant. all US listeners. Um, Apologies. But... <laughs> So what I mean, there's there really isn't much to stop mm. some sort of. I mean, this. I mean, I hope they don't, but they could do a saga where it's like a newspaper. Do you know what I mean? Or like a billboard, yeah. or something similar, or like a newsreel, where it's the saga of like you know, you know, demon gang warfare hits the streets of New Capanna oh, again, my or God, <laughs> kind of thing. As yeah, it spins towards the camera. You can oh, do that's sagas so anywhere. Better. You could definitely do that. Yeah. Because we had the opportunity right in Eldraine, yeah? Because it was like tales and stuff like that. and Because that's another one. But they could have done like fables, right? Because there's the fable of the wolf and the owl in Law, in, from Lorwyn. And that's kind of the other thing I'm mm. thinking, like kids' fairy tales and stuff like that. That was an opportunity they maybe could have done in Eldraine. So if we go back to Eldraine, maybe they do the that. The reason I think they didn't do that, because you are right, you're 100% right. I think it's a very fine distinction. And I think, I don't necessarily think this is something that is like a hard, like this or what was what they carried on. But I think maybe the decision where, because this is how I see it, was that Eldraine was a world where the kind of fables, as you like, were just the world they lived in. Yeah, it wasn't the past. It wasn't theoretical. Hansel and Gretel are characters in Eldraine. The seven dwarves are real in Eldraine. Do you know what I mean? Like they didn't need like mm. sagas or story tales of them. The Kenrith and Linden are 
the people of legend and they are yeah. already there it was only, alive, it was only tw- you know? 10 15 years ago it's not necessarily from because i guess that doesn't necessarily because i guess we don't know when like the akiba reckon raid necessarily happened but it's almost like they need to almost catch us up i guess with kamigawa as well right it's not just oh this is the story now it's like people be like well what happened in between and they go oh okay well here's the shattered states era here's the era of mm-hmm. enlightenment here's the restoration of ijango of, of iganjo like all that kind of thing i guess it's exactly why they gave us stories yeah it's almost like filling in the history right and this is what i mean is is because we, we don't have any other planes that are from back in the day really like we've done our big catch-up ones with dominaria we did a big catch-up one with kamigawa that it's and it's, an, and it's i guess it's now they would have to kind of push for new ground um because i guess even with theros we didn't get it the first time it didn't feel like they were missing we got those kind of like weird um in the pre-release it was like hero cards there was mm. these weird hero cards and they had the similar thing so i think we mentioned this when we talked about them in the theorist so they had like almost like the same idea of like reliefs right of architectural mm. reliefs and that was kind of where they pulled their stories on they probably looked at that and went oh there's ground here we can kind of move into um so yeah i'd be the, interested um, to see where they think they go next with it or what they do next. the other with place them. that we could see this kind of stuff and i think we'll, i'm looking like into kind of very future hypothetical territory now is that if we were to ever go back to a plane like ixalan and we mm. went to Torazon, so the vampire home homeland, which is all obviously it's based on conquistadors, like Spanish conquistadors. So the main religion there is going to be Christianity, probably specifically like uh, Catholicism. And so you're going to have like a lot of like uh, sort of European architecture, and you'll have things like painted ceilings. You'll have yes. uh, a lot of sort of like religious uh, iconography stuff. almost but like for the religion of the dusk rose so that'll be things like you know mm. paintings or tapestries or whatever but done very much in that kind of gothic european art style um and a lot of a lot of like cathedral architecture like is it benini who's the the one of the sort of more famous architects i could be getting that wrong my architecture knowledge is not the best but you will also get like a lot of like um like marble carvings and things so that would be a really good way that if we ever went back to somewhere like ixalan they could have a very fabricated history because it's not really based on they didn't go too hard on the spanish conquistadors like it was just the armor more so than anything else and like the the religiosity they're still vampires so i think they played up the vampire thing maybe more so than the real world like you know these are spanish like invaders you know mm. um but they can have that aesthetic to them you know which i think would be yeah. really cool I like this idea of a false history, like a spun story kind of thing. Of that, it's not like a true representation to us as an audience. It's almost like what's being said to the people of that plane. You know, what are the stories that they are that have circulated? I could see, for example, um, had they not done like a single Phyrexian scriptures one, I could have seen maybe like we're getting a bunch of sagas of the history of Phyrexia from the new Phyrexian's perspective. You know of what do they believe their history is and kind of maybe we'd see that but like, it's one of these things of where i because it's always done so well and even now like i feel the the swing that they did on it of you know flipping into creature sides and then them justifying it mechanically and flavor wise quite quite nicely i don't think any of the cards are particularly egregious you know um it's quite it's, it shows that they don't have to i guess be all in sometimes the environment is the right space for them and i feel like now they've done enough sagas they will always do them justice they because i guess again in the cow time thing it might have been very late into the story they were like well we need some uncommon signifiers uh well this is the story plane we haven't fit sagas in yet screw it let's two birds one stone let's do it every every saga is multicolored and all of them are representing like the history of each individual mm. individual uh, realm they could probably just do that even late in the development go is there space for sagas in this set has it been long enough since we did them because as you said like there was a, a good two and a half year gap between uh dominaria and theorist beyond death and then we've had a set each year that's, that's mm. had sagas involved with and obviously this was the mdfc year so of course or i guess last year was and we get a little bit of that here of where we get mdfc sagas which without even really thinking about it kind of i didn't even notice that this was the first time we've had them do this and i guess mdfcs are so rife now and, and in every set that i didn't even like blink twice about it because of course that makes sense um mm. and it's just i just again living stories right like recce specifically wrote all of the history on himself you know like this is kind of the perfect platform for it and i think it's worked worked really nicely it doesn't feel too clunky yeah. I imagine from a gameplay point of view it must also feel quite nice to kind of go through the motions of the story and then have this this thing this this thing at the end of it, it doesn't just go to your graveyard you've got this now thing this story and all the weight that you can now hit in with and it does a thing and it attacks and it's got all this lovely flavor text on it it's, it's almost like it came to a head with kamigawa right of where of where you have not, not only we telling the stories but we're also living the consequences of the history as well so that's quite nice. 
Good job, Wizards. Very poignant. <laughs> it's very it heavy. That's like <laughs> it's a lot going on there, but I agree. I completely agree. Um, yeah. Cool. I mean, I think I think we've said all we can say about this saga as well. That we're just going around in circles and seeing how great they mm. are. So yeah, I just keep them coming. They're always a blast. Um, a couple of bits mm. of housekeeping for some of the flavour that we've maybe not spoken about over the past few weeks, or maybe some things that we also got wrong. Let's start with what we've got uh, slightly wrong. Um, so. Uh, they did release side stories for Kamigawa, and one of the side stories that they released uh, is called The Foes Who Make Us by Abby May Otis. Otis. Otis? Otis. Um, which tells the story of Heiko and Noriko uh, Yamazaki, who we assumed, just because of the nature of the brothers Yamazaki, were sisters. They are actually cousins, um, which is kind of cool. Like I like I like actually not falling back on consistently having siblings as the rivals like it is mm. it's nice to have other types of like family unit represented i don't like it's, it's not a big i don't think it's a big like whoopsie on our part like the story wasn't out when we said that and we assumed no. a, a thing but yeah they're they're cousins so i, I guess would it makes sense as well i guess it makes sense right for cousins to have differences rather than brother and sister right because that's usually like different households might have different values so it kind of makes that mm. makes more they're sense also anyway. um they're also like comp- they were raised very separately as well in the story. I yeah. won't read really spoil the story. You go read the story, but yeah, they're cousins. Um, and also, just I just want to flag up the utter gluttony of <laughs> of flavor story things that we have been given. So not only did we get the the main magic story, which you know episodes one to five, which we covered, and obviously the saga stories, which we also covered, and then the uh the prologue to the main stories which we covered uh we also got the side stories for uh the commander deck characters and the cousins yamazaki we also got a manga yeah yeah i just wanted to know i was like where did this come out how did where, where, where did where did they hide this Oh, it's beautiful. Well, they're not hiding it? anywhere. It's it's literally on there. No, but I know. But I didn't I didn't see it. I didn't. I don't, I don't know why I didn't. Did it? When did it drop? Did it drop like very very recently? Like a week and a half ago, as far as I'm aware. Okay. 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 They also they also got a uh, like a is it an animated comic or like oh, I don't man, know how they're yeah. describing it. The, the, They've the, got the, back the trailers, as well. man. The trailers are so good. This this. So oh, right. so no no no. So not the trailers. Sorry. This is like another like. This is like a another story thing, but it's like an animated like comic panel thing, uh, and then they also have the trailers for the game. So obviously, when the when the set uh, got um, sort of like um, teasered, you had that sort of uh, thirty to forty second thing where you saw uh, the ninja with the Tanuki mask, who I'm assuming is now Kaito, although yeah. Other than the Snooky mask, it's not very Kaito esque. And then it kind of pulls out, and you see the wanderer on the rooftops, and it's got the the kind of uh, deep synth music playing. And that was the thing. They've done an extended version of that trailer, which has Japanese voiceover on it now. So that's now like a two minute like thing with the Snooky mask and the wanderer. And then, yeah, you're right. They've done a fully animated anime three and a half minute set trailer. Mm. Why, where's what? the rest of my movie, <laughs> Wizards? Why would you do? You clearly have the funds and the ability and the talent to be able to make this the, this the, this a thing. Like, oh, you're gods. so spoiled. You're I know, so but spoiled. it gives me it gives me so much faith. Again. For, no, it gives me faith <laughs> for the series because if they do this mini series with any of the same amount of care and attention, I mean, I don't know who obviously the production studio was or anything did. I had to look it up, but because I mean, the art style was fantastic. I guess off the back of Arcane and stuff like that, like I guess they're trying to tap into the okay that we're we're on a we're on a a futuristic steampunky anime vibe kind of thing right and it kind mm. of works um and it's so good it's really well done <laughs> the voice acting in it's great the art style's fantastic i didn't realize how much i needed the wanderer and also it kind of plays into slightly different character notes right because it plays into it almost makes them look as if they're kind of there's a relationship forming there like a romantic relationship forming whereas i feel like in the story it was very understated if like not stated at all um, I feel like they kind of left it open for the for the audience to kind of ship them or not ship yeah, them as much as they I wanted to. Yeah, I sort of to. feel like, I mean, uh, oh no, I'm not even going to go down that well. I was about to say, like, we both watch our fair share of anime, and I tend to think that is the kind of usual trope of, like, mm. slightly unrequited, downplayed love between a, a mask and a femme protagonist in anime. But then yeah. there's so much anime out there and people who watch way more than it than I do that I could probably be completely wrong on that. But just from my experience of watching anime, that's usually the kind of thing. They like or at least in 
in it's the stereotype, short right? Form. Yeah, it's the stereotypes, or at least in like you know, like when they if they do like a three minute trailer or like an opening credit sequence for a TV show, that's the kind of story they try and tell. Whether that's actually the thing, but mm-hmm. I think also I really like the the touch of having the song that went along with the trailer is that very classic anime thing of having lyrics that almost bear no bearing yeah, on absolutely. what's actually going on. <laughs> like, it's just I a fight cool for the, song. I fight for the blinding sun that might reach your eyes, and you're like. But that has yeah, nothing to right. do with what's going on on screen. <laughs> yeah, Fine. I also love that's, that in the manga. Yeah, I love the fact that in the manga, um, Ginger Taxius has these like really fancy p- trousers on. I feel like this is one of these big. <laughs> this is the biggest thing out of this set, right? Is 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 Ginger Taxius's dress sense because he was just wearing this weird like kind of robey thing in the original Frexia, and then he got like new 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 uh, new threads, new ice, as it were. Um, and it's quite nice to see everyone kind of like losing their shit over like, well, what what's he going to be wearing next next time? I, I just... Well, not. Not only losing their shit, mate. There's like people being full on horny on main for Jing. Thirsty for gin. I love a a double gin. I love a double gin and tonic, please. Thank you. Like (laughs) people. Not he's a. I mean, he's a Phyrexian praetor, and also he's objectively the most terrifying looking one. Uh In a world where you have Shieldred and. Uh, Elish Norn and Jinka Taxis is the one that people are like lusting after. I mean, yeah, exactly. I don't want to lust after any of them, but I'm just saying. Like... Yeah, but you can kind of almost understand the other two, right? There's like, it's like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> yeah, it's so. Is this big metal man. It's so funny. It's in it, a set where you've got the Wanderer, who's like super kawaii, kawaii over here, and then you've got Best Mum Tamio, who's also now got a super sexy Borg transformation, and everyone's just thirsty for gin. It's, it's so, it's so, ugh. So, I just, so but obviously, <laughs> it's just, it's just the magic community just having fun with nonsense, yeah. isn't it? which I think is, you know, it's, I mean, I think it's fair to say that the people at Wizards of the Coast, I'm going to go out on a limb and say they really fucking love Kamigawa. <laughs> yeah, with the amount think, of stuff we've got. Yeah, I thought the audience response back in the day was unless it was unfair because again we've already talked about this when we were looking through um art style and things a couple of weeks ago where there is such a wealth and depth to kamigawa that those that loved it really loved it and i feel like if you're deep mm. into the game either game lore or gameplay um and a lot of people up in the head office in, in wizards will be um they'd have been around and designing and playing during this time and again even if you just played it within this in a limited environment it was a really fun set to play it just has a lot of negativity that residual negativity and it kind of shows that if you have enough people that really care for it you can turn that around because again as you say there is still some discourse i feel like there's not going to be a magic set that doesn't have some push or pull i feel like that's just the kind of kind of current world we live in right that everyone has to have Mm. the extreme like or the extreme dislike and there's always evidence one way or another because it's all conjecture that um as long as the people upstairs who are making it have the love and, and affection you kind of it, it clearly manifests within the set anyway um and I feel yeah, like, yeah well nice yeah and, and love and affection and respect enough to do it right these days as well i think that's yes. the main thing is like you know it's all there is the discourse is often around people going well like clearly they like this thing because they've paid homage to it and it's like yeah but they've also just paid homage to what their pop culture understanding of the thing is like mm. there is now the level of that you have love and respect for what you're doing and then that will show through it to create something that's almost perfect as a product which yeah. i think by all accounts and i think by a lot of understandings neon dynasty is just one of the most tightly flavored sets in all aspects and you can't you just can't fault it and um, the one last thing that I, I will talk about that we didn't talk about just now in terms of the things they brought out is the original soundtrack for the set like a yeah. bunch of different musicians and bands to do music for kamigawa <laughs> It's all a little. Is this what we're going to get with every set? Yeah, it's all a little surreal. It's kind of like when the Fortnite th- secret led drop thing happened. I was just like, oh, is this where we are now? Like, and I'm not. I'm very much not. Again, I don't like fighting the verve, as it were. Like, I was very much uh, when I heard about the Warhammer and I heard about um, Street Fighter. I was like, bring it on. Why not? Let's see what we can do with it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's weird having a, a magic music video. It's almost like, mm. I like having my geekdom compartmentalized. I don't need it exposed and open to the rest of the world for critique, you know? <laughs> and I feel like that's kind oh, of well, weird. Yeah. I, I will say that if Wizards of the Coast want to pay musicians to write music for the game, then by all means, go for it, because someone will enjoy it. Mm. I personally have almost no interest in the original soundtrack for Kamigawa. But, isn't you know, it bad, that's isn't just it bad that this is Isn't it bad that this is almost like the opposite for the um, stories? Like, there are people out there going, 
oh, if Wizards wants to put money into writing novels for their sets, they can, but it, it doesn't interest me whatsoever. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing. It's know, exactly it's the same thing. Damn, that means that means they're kind of right because I I agree on the opposite side. Yeah, I'm like, cool. If you want to do music videos and stuff like that, like, great, cool. It's not that's so for me. There's a lot. There's a lot of people out there that really enjoy it, um, which is yeah. good. I'm glad. Um, Arguably, hope it means... a, a two minute song is far easier to digest than you know, like five hours worth of reading content. Do you know? What I mean? I've got to do reading. I can't just watch and listen. No. Oh, I'm a terrible Shock. reader. I'm a really bad reader. I'd much like maybe maybe I will just listen to the soundtrack. Maybe this will become Magic <laughs> the Flaming Orb within the soundtrack That's podcast true. now. That's it. Embed embed your magic story into a soundtrack in an audio file and you're fine. Get yeah. Stephen Fry to read your magic stories and people will buy the shit out of it. Well, Voice of All, which is, who's a content creator, used to do audiobooks of... But I, I swear don't there's someone out there who still, still does that. No, there's someone else, but they do a reductions on it. They do like a... Um, story redux so it won't be word for word it'll be kind of similar to like what we do but with a bit more expansion on it um that's something that who knows i hope it brings it back i guess it depends on how much novel novelization there is to do it with right Mm. good it feels like we came to the end of the episode there (laughs) good Listeners, if uh, you want to let us know what your favourite sagas are, then please do let us know via our social media channels uh, at mtflavoring. Uh, emails go to mtflavoring at gmail.com. My personal Twitter is at Andy Manface. Nathan's, yours is? At the Fox in the Moon. Um, yeah, we're on episode 99. One more to go. Um, Nathan, you are off very soon on your travels around um. the places that are not here. Um I have already started backlogging some episodes that will be coming out over the next few months. There were some pretty exciting guests coming on. It was already weird. I So I did a recording yesterday for an uh, episode that will be coming out in about three weeks or whatever. Um, and it was very odd, I will say, doing this exact sign-off without you there. <laughs> I think I even mentioned it. I was like, I don't know how to finish this episode. <laughs> Did you did you did you did you say did you say my past should see you soon or did you just leave no did you leave the world hanging no they don't I know when they're going to see you next oh god <laughs> I didn't I didn't even uh, just finish it with uh, thank you so much for listening this has been magic the flavoring I didn't even do that which would just be a fine sign off I I think I just flumped it and just went <laughs> uh, cool bye <laughs> see, see you later I guess um, yeah. <laughs> great amazing uh, i'm kind of excited it's, i guess yeah it's, it's gonna be odd i feel like when it came to um interview episodes especially doing it remotely it's much more difficult with three people because even now doing it and I'm, I'm looking at you over um the uh, video it kind of helps because we never we don't really talk about it any depth like the 20 episodes we did in person it kind of felt like the uh, flow was a bit um that more natural it took us a few episodes to get back into the rhythm again of doing it remotely right mm-hmm. i feel like maybe people it becomes a bit too uh, chaotic but i can't yeah it is, it is it is weird i mean i am gonna be back in the summer so hopefully we can do like a little um like a, a season 2.5 or whatever um by then sure. lots of shit would have happened i'm sure in magic it always yeah. does um well yeah. we will get to that when we get to that all right exactly all that remains for me to say is thank you so much for listening this has been magic the flavoring we'll see you soon yay you said it